Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Aaron Ramirez from the Special Collections and Museum Services Department of the Pueblo City County Library District um, in Pueblo, Colorado. And you are participating in the Life and Times of Abigail Adams uh, with Adams herself. Uh, this is a program brought to you by a generous grant from the Gilder Lerman Institute of American History as part of the Revi Revisiting the Founding Era grant. Um, if you're interested in learning more about the founding era through original documents of the time, essays, and lesson plans, uh, look for the Gilder Lerman link in the chat. But stay tuned now because it is July 4th, 1801, and you are friends and relatives of Abigail Adams. She has invited you to her residence in Quincy, Massachusetts, to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. She has gathered you in her newly finished parlor in hopes of lifting her spirits. She and her husband, John, have returned from the Capitol where John had been serving as our country's second president. He lost re-election to Thomas Jefferson, which has severed the decades of friendship between the men. Abigail is feeling uncharacteristically nostalgic. It appears that she will address us now. Good afternoon, Mrs. Adams. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my dears. It is so good of you to have come. It is a cordial to my heart to see you all. And on this, the celebration day of our Declaration for Independence, a toast to a perpetual union for our colonies. I have a letter. It is from my husband, John Adams. He wrote it to me in that summer of 1776, when he was attending the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. He writes, the second day of July will be the most memorable in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. July 2nd was when our 13 colonies voted for independence. 12 colonies united in agreement and New York declined to vote. The Congress argued tirelessly for two days, editing and revising this most important document. And then on July 4th, the final draft was accepted. John's letter continues. You will think me transported with enthusiasm, but I am not. I know I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration and support and defend these states. Yet through the gloom, I can see the rays of ravishing light and glory I can see that the end is more than worth all the means. John had been absent from Massachusetts since August of 74. It was I who witnessed the means from our farm in Braintree. Should I attempt to describe to you the complicated miseries and distresses brought upon us by the late inhumane acts of British Parliament? My words would fail me. Suffice it to say that we were invaded by fleets and, and armies. Our commerce not only obstructed, but completely ruined. The courts of justice, shut. Hundreds driven out of Boston. Thousands reduced to want or the charity of their neighbors for a daily supply of food. 
all the horrors of a civil war awaiting us. John had been gone nearly a year when I woke one morning with a startle. A booming sound it shook my whole house. The windows rattled to the point of certain shatter. I leapt from bed. I met a very anxious John Quincy on the stairs. He was just shy of eight years old. Mother, what is happening? Dress quickly and meet me downstairs. We hurried up the hill behind the old farm to the granite outcropping which offered the greatest vantage point. Young Johnny spotted the smoke on the horizon and then I, its source, Charlestown. The birthplace of my father was under attack. The booming of the canyons rolled across the bay and the salt marshes and washed over us where we stood. There was another sound too, more constant and tinny, like hail on a milking bucket, musket fire. We stood in silent horror, not believing our eyes. Buildings were ablaze and the wood smoke heavy on the humid, stifling air. We could not see the men fall. And I know not if the cries of the wounded were audible at such distance, but I heard them in my mind. Standing on that hill, Johnny's soft, small hand in mine. A chill ran through me and struck fear in my heart. There had been skirmishes with the British for years. Lexington and Concord just two months earlier had given us great anxieties, but this battle surpassed all that had come before. My pen found vent at writing to John. My dearest friend, the day, perhaps the decisive day is come on which the fate of America depends. I have just heard that our dear friend, Dr. Warren is no more, but fell gloriously fighting for his country saying better to die honorably in the field than ignominiously hang upon the gallows. The roar of the cannon is so distressing that we cannot eat, drink, or sleep. Tis expected the British will come out over the bay tonight and a dreadful battle will ensue. I shall tarry here till tis thought unsafe by my neighbors and then I have secured myself a retreat at your brother's home. Amidst all our sorrows, we had an abundant reasons for gratitude that so few of our brethren were counted amongst the slain whilst our enemies were cut down like grass before the scythe every account agreed in 14 and 15 hundred men slain and wounded upon their side the british commanding officer was overheard to exclaim Many more battles like this and our army shall be destroyed. When I consider the circumstances attending this battle, I stand amazed that all our men were not killed. They had but 100 foot entrenched. The number? 
of militia engaged did not exceed 800 men. And they had not half the ammunition enough. Were I a man, I would have to be on the battlefield. I could not endure the thought of my habitation desolated, my children butchered, and I an inactive spectator. My sense of helplessness was, I enlisted the help of John's youngest brother, Elihu. He was serving with a militia unit of colonials that uh, they called themselves the Minutemen as they were ready to fight in a moment's notice. We gathered all of my pewter and solicited more at my neighbors. We melted down cups, plates, cutlery to make musket balls. It was a hot endeavor that summer. All of us crowded into the small kitchen in the old farm. The children helped. Nabby, the oldest at nine, she would hold the mold in her small hands and I would pour the molten liquid very carefully in while she held it steady until it cooled and set. And then Johnny would come and, and pry it out. And then Charlie would come along behind him and collect them into a sack. We could make 15 shots from one pound of lead. It had formerly been the pride and ambition of Americans to enjoy the fashion and manufactures of Great Britain. But once she threatened us, we scorned to wear her livery and felt ourselves more decently attired in the coarse and plain vestures of our own manufacture. I sought flax and wool and worked willingly with my hands. Indeed, there was opportunity for all our industry and economy. I've always churned my own butter. It is far superior to any available for purchase. But at this time, I also learned to mill soap, make quill ink, and fashion rough pins. We milled corn into meal, and we substituted molasses and maple syrup for sugar when we baked. John's cousin Samuel Adams used to brag that with the ladies on our side, we shall make every Tory tremble. We were obliged to place the militia upon the ocean shores every evening for threat of invasion. All our dears were hazarding their life and property at this time. One militia unit had been practicing their formations in our field since before the snow had melted that spring and young Johnny would fall in at the back of the ranks and he would march right alongside the soldiers. A sight which both thrilled me as a patriot and as a mother, a mother of sons, it filled me with dread. Upon our friend, Mr. Rice's going into the army, he asked Charlie, who was not quite five years old, if he should get him a place among the soldiers. Well, Charlie catched at the idea with great enthusiasm and insisted upon going. We could not put him off it. He begged and cried, 
No obstacle we could raise was sufficient to satisfy him until I told him he must first get his father's permission. And then he insisted that I write to John immediately and was every day for three weeks asking, Mother, is there news? What news from father? Is there news from father? I was anxious for word from John as well. Sending correspondence was a dangerous endeavor at this time. You see, the mere assembly of the Continental Congress was in itself an act of treason. When we could find friends and, and trusted colleagues to transport our letters, it took a fortnight to reach Philadelphia from Boston, two whole weeks. All my letters from John seem to have been written in such haste that they barely left room for a social feeling. They let me know he lived, but some of them contain scarcely six lines. I wanted some sentimental effusions of the heart. But this time, word came of the appointment of George Washington to command our newly formed Continental Army. It was an appointment that was met with universal satisfaction. Upon his arrival in Cambridge, I was struck with General Washington. John had prepared me to entertain a favorable opinion of him, but I, I thought the half of it had not been told to me. Dignity with ease and complacency. The gentlemen and the soldiers seemed agreeably blended in him. Modesty marked every line and, and feature of his face. He has had my unwavering support since that first meeting. Shortly after the astounding military maneuver of March of 1776, in which our army brought the massive cannons that had been hauled all the way back from Ticonderoga, New York, to the high ground at Dorchester Heights and aimed them at the British fleet in Boston Harbor. Well, the British began planning their evacuation. British transports remained in our harbor for well, well into June of that month, that year, and they were hardly as frightening to our people as the threat of pestilence. Smallpox, it racked the body with fever and backache, headache and, and nausea. Once the fever broke, Sores would erupt in the soft tissue of the mouth, uh, nose, and throat, and then out to the rest of the body. I decided that all of my family would undergo inoculation, and we traveled into Boston to stay with my Uncle Isaac. Inoculation was still considered radical, even after the campaign of 64, when John had undergone the procedure, it involved making a cut about an inch in length and inserting into the channel tissue from one already afflicted with the pox. Well, his procedure and his very long recovery it delayed our wedding that year, but that's a story for a different time. 
I knew John's mind so perfectly regarding the health of our family that I did not hesitate to make this decision by myself, as I knew that our recovery, recovery would be equally pleasing to him and that as to our safety, there was no better option. All of my children under the age of 11, they underwent the procedure quite manfully. Such a spirit of inoculation never before had been witnessed. Every house in Boston housed as many people as it could. There were no less than 30 persons from Braintree lodging with my uncle. That is how it came to be that I was in Boston on July 18th of 1776. And after hearing a rather good sermon, I went with the multitudes into King Street to hear the Declaration for Independence read and proclaimed. Colonel Kraft addressed the crowd from the balcony of the State House, and the boisterous crowd hushed to hang on his every word. The excitement was palpable. I stood facing west. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands that have connected them to another. Independence. A thought too treasonous to think just a year before and now proclaimed publicly and that a person associated so closely with me should be a, a principal actor in laying the foundation for our country's future greatness. Tears of gratitude spilled from my eyes. My husband had been appointed by Congress to the five member committee that was charged with writing this very document. Colonel Crafts continued in his unwavering voice. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I found myself rather distracted. Do you think the passion for liberty beats equally as strong in the hearts of men who are accustomed to deny their fellows of theirs? John felt slavery was a contagion upon the human spirit. I, I wish that there were not a slave in the province. I was disappointed that Congress had not ended the vile practice at the very inception of our independence in this very document. I had always found it a rather inequitous scheme to fight ourselves for what we are daily robbing and plundering from those who have as much a right to freedom as we have. I had written to John well before he was appointed to this committee that in the new code of laws, he remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than his ancestors. I asked that he not put such unlimited powers into the hands of husbands, as all men would be tyrants if they could. I warned that if particular care and attention were not paid to the ladies, we would be bound to foment a rebellion and would not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we had no voice or representation. 
John had called my words saucy. I have often lamented that patriotism in the female sex is the most disinterested of all virtues. Excluded from honors and from offices, we cannot attach ourselves to any state or government for having held a position of eminence. Even in the freest countries, our possessions are at the control and disposal of to whom the law has given sovereign authority. Is it not sufficient to make us And yet, in all history, and every age, there are examples of patriotism in the female sex, which, considering our circumstances, is equal to the most heroic of men. Remember how I was struck with boot flesh as Colonel Cross concluded with the lines with full reliance on divine, divine providence. We mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Cheers erupted from the balcony. All right, folks, uh, it appears that we're having some technical difficulties, so uh, we'll try to get Abigail back and back on the stream as soon as possible. Thanks. Please stay tuned. Abigail Adams will return shortly.
Stay tuned. Abigail Adams will return shortly. Hello again, this is Aaron uh, from uh, PCCLD. So uh, we've lost Abigail uh, for the moment, but uh, she will be back shortly. And it looks like she's come, she's come back right now. So uh, let's, um, let's uh, say hello again to Abigail Adams. My dears. I don't know if you can appreciate that on that day in 1776, we were all so filled with the celebration of this declaration of independence, but yet we were still so far from that being realized. We could not have triumphed over Britain without John's successful negotiating of an alliance with France. When the Treaty of Paris ended the Revolutionary War in 1783, I felt certain that John would return to his family and farm. But he begged me to join him in Paris. Were I to regale you with the stories of my ocean voyage and my time in Europe. I should keep you in my parlor until next Saturday. <laughs> now, in, in 89, I was much pleased when General Washington was unanimously elected our country's first president with my husband, John, serving as his vice president. I was so pleased to discover that his wife, Martha, was equally enjoyable and competent and the most gracious hostess I have met in my entire life. Hosting weekly dinners, returning uh, private visits, entertaining heads of state, uh, 
presiding over public ceremonies and running a large home. She seemed never to fluster with the responsibilities foisted upon her. With the title Lady Washington, she became the national arbiter of manners, style, and social constraints. I have emulated, I have endeavored to emulate her on every account to Lady Washington. When word came that President Washington would not seek a second re-election, I made it clear to John that I would serve under no other president but Washington. From the time I was a young girl, I was taught that one should happily surrender to divine providence. And indeed, that was what I did when John was elected president by a narrow margin over Thomas Jefferson. In my years as the president's wife, or as I privately referred to them, my splendid misery, I had many affairs of state with which to host including the 4th of July celebrations. They were a tedious day as we entertained every member of Congress, all the gentlemen of the city, the governor, the officers, all of whom the former President Washington had treated with cake and punch and wine. I was informed that the day cost $500 with more than 200 going to the cake alone. One fourth of July, it was 90 degrees in the shade. I know not how I didn't faint from the effort of it all. I hate to complain. No one is without difficulties whether in high or low life, and every person knows best where their own shoe pinches. That one term as president, it aged John more than the years should. It was fraught with dissension and disappointment. Gone was that unifying feeling of our uh, one independence. War with France was threatening. John grew ever more disheartened by the growing political chasm. I had once called Thomas Jefferson one of the choicest men on earth. His intelligent conversation on all manners of topics and his distinguishable manners and grace and his words, the power of his words, how wise Congress had been all those years ago to make him chief drafter of our declaration. When John lost re-election to Jefferson last fall, we were grateful to take our leave of the new capital in Washington. Politics on the whole and Thomas Jefferson. And to return to Massachusetts, to our farm, to our family, and to our friends. Mm. There is so much more I wish to share with you, but 
It's nearly time for refreshments. First, do you have any questions for me? Hello again. Thank you for recounting all of that, your life and all of the events. So extraordinary and exciting and terrifying and so many things. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have some questions here that I've solicited from my colleagues at the library here in Pueblo, Colorado, a place unknown to you, I imagine, uh, but a wonderful place you should visit once you, you get the opportunity uh, to come out west. Um, we have, uh, and I'd also invite all the viewers now to, to submit their questions uh, to First Lady Adams uh, through the comments function of their YouTube or Facebook stream. Uh, I'll start off with Cynthia, who asks, what is your one tip for life? How to succeed in life? Well, my dear Cynthia, my one tip for how to succeed at life It is a good attitude, my dear. As I said, no one is without difficulties, but it is a, it is a attitude that affects whether we are in misery or not. There were many times in my life that I found the circumstances intolerable. John's absence, the fighting so close to home. There were many days I did not wish to, to part my curtains and see what awaited me outside of my home. But yet, I felt it my duty to my family, to my country, to carry myself with faith, and with optimism for the future. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have um, Thad who asks, um, would you talk about, and you've touched, you've touched upon this, but would you talk about your letters to, to your husband, John, while he was abroad, your correspondence? Well, I began my practice of writing nightly to John to inform him of what had transpired in town that day, uh, when he had left to serve the Continental Congress in August of 74. I found that sometimes my pen was my only pleasure and writing to John how I composed the thoughts in my mind. I did it as much for me as for him. Truly, I was horrified to learn that he shared my letters on the floor of Congress. I was never formally educated. Women of my age weren't. And I have always been a terrible speller. I was mortified to imagine the learned men who read my letters. But John said it was rather moving that he could not pay any man in Massachusetts to give such a fair recounting of the events in his home state. I am grateful that I was able to persuade the other colonies to vote in favor of independence for our Continental Army and the appointment of General Washington to command our troops. John did not write me as frequently as I would have wished, but I knew that his time was not his own, and I wished that what I sacrificed would be reaped by our fledgling country. And I do feel that it was. There was an entire year when John 
and my firstborn son, John Quincy, were abroad in Europe, that I had not one letter from them. I was heart sick. That was my only connection to my family. Those letters, I read them and reread them. We passed them amongst each other too. John would write of what was transpiring in Europe in the grand scale of the world, which to those of us in Braintree, Massachusetts seemed otherworldly. It was our entertainment, our connection, and our refuge. Thank you. Um... Do you have time for one more question? Certainly. Okay. This is something, this is a question from me. Uh, how do you feel about the widespread drink found in the United States, in our young republic, the widespread drinking of alcohol? How does that, how, how, do, you, how do you find that? How do I find the widespread drinking of alcohol? Well, a good Massachusetts cider on my palate is always welcomed. However, among the characteristics I hold most dear in any person whom I have close contact is sobriety. There are many who drink more than I would choose them to. And some have acted in utter disgrace, in my opinion. But others' character is not mine to bear. I wish that my own family would be quite astute in limiting their consumption. I don't often speak of my brother, William. My sisters and I were always rather embarrassed of his conduct. He took to drink early in life and indeed it took his life when he was still rather young. His daughter, Louisa, my niece, she is the most devoted of of companions to John and I. I'm so grateful to have returned to Quincy to be with her. I have raised her ever since her father passed. I hope that our country will grow in maturity in many ways, and especially with the drink. Well, now, Aaron, I am going to return to my original state as Jessica Downing Ford, the researcher of Abigail Adams. And now I could answer any question that you may have about um, the Adams family, her life, her death, whatever you've got for me. Great. Well, well hello, Jessica. Uh, it's good to see you. Um, uh, that was a fantastic performance. Thank you so much. Um, just uh, just off the bat, uh, Noreen uh, says, this was an off awesome performance, loved it. Edward says, so very, very talented. Deb uh, says, I'm very impressed. So thank you for tuning in, all of you. And um, and thank you again for, for being here, Jessica. So how, I guess, just... Uh, I'm interested in how did you come to do this, um, uh, embodying Abigail Adams? Well, I am originally from Braintree, Massachusetts. And in fact, my first job, um, I worked right on this same uh, street as the Adams, the old farm that Abigail refers to in that monologue. Um, and I pass them every day when I would go to get tea for my boss. And of course, I was 16 and I couldn't be bothered. And it wasn't until I returned, uh, my family's still in Massachusetts, 
And uh, when my son had finished fifth grade, that summer when we went home, suddenly I viewed the history that I had grown up so blind to through the eyes of a young student who had just been introduced to the founding era of our country. And so I would hear him from the back of the car say, wait, is that the Bunker Hill Monument? Is, is that the Faneuil Hall? And so it was on that trip um, that my mother said, oh, we should go tour the Adams houses. I hear it's an excellent tour. And we went and indeed to put my hand on the banister in, uh, in Peacefield in Quincy, Massachusetts and, and know the dignitaries that had put their hand there as well. It brought history alive in me in a way that I had never experienced before. And um, so then the following year, we went back um, on the 4th of July, they do a reenactment of the signing of the Declaration for Independence. And they had a woman portraying Abigail who delivered the Remember the Ladies uh, speech, which brought me to tears. And suddenly Abigail was my heroine. Um, but it wasn't until three years ago when um, the museum in downtown Grand Junction, Colorado, where I am, um, offered an adult Chautauqua workshop. And I, I got into that first class and the facilitator said, who is your historical figure? And I just said, Abigail Adams. And I almost didn't know how much I wanted to portray her. And over these last three years, my love affair with this woman, this patriot, mother, and all around um, inspirational figure has just deepened. Um, she was remarkable in her unusual amount of education. She was not a well person her entire life. So she found her adventure and her, um, her connection through the books in her father's library. Um, her grandmother Quincy had an extensive library, so she was self-taught. That was part of what John fell in love with and continued to nurture through her whole life. Um, their marriage was one for the ages. He um, really considered her uh, much his equal in ways that just was uncommon at that time. And she was let into conversations about politics that most women would never have heard, let alone participated in. Um, and so she is just near and dear to my heart. I am always so honored to get to, to put on the bonnet and uh, portray her. And I'm so grateful for the opportunity uh, to be a part of this presentation today. Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful uh, to you for, for participating with joining us. Uh, I guess, uh, so it seems like they're uh, John and Abigail's relationship was more uh, their dynamic relationship dy dynamics were more of a modern sort of marriage, I guess, of, of more, uh, uh, w would that be an accurate kind of uh, description of that or? Well, I think there are definitely aspects of their marriage that, that translate well into modern society. It's not uncommon, um, especially out here in the West, for husbands to work and earn their living away from their wives and their children um, when they, they travel to where the work is. But at the time that John goes off to serve at the Continental Congress, it isn't really commonplace. And especially when he goes to Europe, they're apart for five years. And, you know, in the first 20 years of their marriage, they spend more than half of it apart. But that break in their continuity in Europe um, is heartbreaking to Abigail. Because amidst that year when there's no word from John, 
you can imagine, um, you know, rumors are not uh, out of the ordinary back in colonial America. And there were many rumors about John that certainly he couldn't love Abigail very much if he would continue his service at such great a distance from her. And Abigail just kind of kept picking herself up from these and dusting herself off and ensuring herself that indeed her husband still loves her above all, but yet there's no letters. And so it's a, by the time John asks her to go to Europe, she is so desperate to be reunited with him that she very quickly overcomes her fears about an ocean journey, which is very uncommon for a woman to make and almost never done without the companionship of her husband. So, you know, we understand what would drive her to such a bold action when we comprehend um, she was terribly depressed, isolated and alone in Massachusetts and longed to be um, rotating in that sphere of her husband and the political world that when she, when he's at the Continental Congress and letters are passing back and forth and and other members of Congress, you know, when they would come through Massachusetts, they would visit her. You know, George Washington comes to her home. She is quite a, a dignitary and, um, you know, very much in the spotlight. But when he goes to Europe, she becomes sort of the forgotten um, because it's all happening outside of her sphere. And uh, so when they're reunited in Europe, um, there, you know, she vows that she will not be without him again. And, and she is, um, again, she's not a well woman. So there are multiple times when he's in Philadelphia as vice president that she is not with him. In fact, her health kept her from being at his inauguration as president. Um, and so, but those separations were for much shorter periods of time and without an ocean between them felt not nearly as, as massive. Um, but they, when Abigail dies, um, John writes to Thomas Jefferson by that point that the, the feud has been settled and he writes to Thomas Jefferson that he wishes he could lie down and die with her wow. because they really were dearest friends to each other. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, I guess, uh, if you have, have time for one last, maybe Certainly. one and a half questions. Uh, so what is the most, uh, number one, what is the, the most surprising thing that you found in your research of this time and of Abigail Adams? And number two, what would your advice be for students that are interested in history um, and would like to, to, I guess, dive in, uh, maybe interested in uh, interpreting history as, as you did today? What would your advice be? All right. Well, I'll speak to the latter point of that question first. How yeah. would students be able to get involved in interpreting history um, today? And what I would say is find your primary sources. There is Abigail's letters are still in existence at the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, Massachusetts there are more than 2000 letters still in existence. Um, the letter that she writes to John after the Battle of Bunker Hill, that June 17th of 75, um, the last time I was allowed to travel to Massachusetts, um, I got to see that letter under glass. I thought I was going to faint. Um, but what I found in my research is that Abigail's words are right there for me um, in this probably, you know, six pages of, of script today. There were more than 30 footnotes. Um, those are direct quotes from her. It is best to find your historical figure's own words 
And so proficient writers of letters and journal keepers, those are the best, easiest characters to bring to life because they've left you their own words and thoughts about um, their their time and the, the trials that they endured. Um, and then as for, um, Aaron, I'm not sure I remember the first part of that question. The the most surprising or, or shocking thing that you've come across in your research. The most surprising or shocking thing. Well, when I consider the circumstances under which Abigail is raising four small children, I think um, at this point in in our cultural history. Um, there are many parents who will see this and will appreciate that during the revolution, there were no schools in session. Does that sound familiar? So she's responsible for all the education of her four children. Not only that, they live on a farm. So she is overseeing um, the, the planting and the sowing and the harvesting which in the midst of a revolution, all the able-bodied men have been called to duty. So she is at a loss for help on the farm. Also, where they lived is about 10 miles outside of Boston. So when these battles are happening and the cannons are going all through the night, literally nobody is sleeping. Like she wrote to John, we cannot eat, drink, or sleep. That's not an isolated incident. There's a, right before the Continental Army gets hold of the high ground of Dorchester, there's three nights of constant cannon fire. She is beside herself. By, by the 5th of March, when she finds out, that the Continental Army has taken the strategic point. I mean, she is just daffy with exhaustion and all of her neighbors are too. And so consider how much more anxious, depressed, um, sad we can be when we are deprived sleep. And so to consider all of those circumstances stacked one on top of the other in Abigail's every day, day to day, and never knowing if today is going to be the day that the, the British army arrives in her front yard. I am just astounded that she was able to educate her children and keep keep the farm. And basically, once John, you know, John's a, a lawyer before he serves the Continental Congress, but once he serves, um, he isn't paid for that. So Abigail is keeping the family upright with her own industry and smarts. And one of the things that was really surprising for me to discover was that um, Abigail had an uncle, Uncle Tufts. Um, he was her agent because as stated, women aren't allowed to own property um, during this time. And so they're not allowed to purchase anything. But when John goes to Europe and there are shortages of anything and everything that people could want in the colonies, she has him send items back and she sells them to family and friends and neighbors. And with that money, she pays the taxes on the farm, but she also keeps a little bit of it. And it's the money that she calls hers and she keeps it separate from the family's money. And then as things are transpiring with currency and paper money and all of this stuff more than I can go into right now, she buys up a bunch of, of currency and essentially makes money off knowing how the currency is going to go because she is in the know politically in the state of Massachusetts. Essentially, <laughs> we would probably call it insider trading. Yeah, that sounds okay. that sounds like it. Yeah. So that's like my least favorite thing about Abigail. I said it, I put mm -hmm. it out there. But um, but the reason why she does it is because she is maintaining um not only her family, 
But Abigail is, is incredibly generous to neighbors, to refugees out of um, Boston during the siege. Um, she basically, um, she keeps uh, John's mother. There, there are two farms. The old farm are like really close together. And John's mom lives in this one and, and the Adams live here. And so she looks after John's mother. Um, it's a, she's an amazing woman. And so I don't agree with her methods, but I do agree with all of the generosity that having money at a time when so few people did allowed her to do for her fellow man and woman. Interesting. Well, yeah. Fascinating, fascinating person. And, uh, just incredible times. And again, thank you for joining us today. And uh, if you are interested uh, in seeing more of Abigail Adams, I believe the, the your Facebook site is Being Abigail. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Okay. And if anybody had questions that weren't answered today, if you can't tell, I kind of could talk about this woman for hours on end. So if you have a question you would like to send me, um, you can find me, send me an email at beingabigail at yahoo.com. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you again, Jessica. And, um, and I appreciate it. And maybe one of these days we can see you uh, down in Pueblo in person. Here's hoping. Okay. Well, thanks very much and have a good day. You too. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Bye-bye.